lot of movement in the past few days when it comes to litigation against Illinois' gun and magazine ban, with the U.S. Supreme Court moving several cases out of Illinois and a case out of Maryland to conference. What exactly does that mean, and what's the status of other challenges against gun control laws? in the state of Illinois. Well, somebody who knows a lot about that and more, Todd Vandermeid, uh, the gun law guru. Uh, he is uh, well known for uh, his channel, Freedom's Steel, here on YouTube. A lot of you check that out all the time, but I'm glad to have him here with us. Todd, thanks for taking time this morning, and uh, let's just get right on into it. Uh, there's been a lot of movement lately. There has, there has. So we have been going through some back and forth with the state on the issue of discovery and experts in the cases since Judge McGlynn in the four Southern Illinois cases has decided that he's planning on, uh, you know, moving forward on a trial on the merits of the case. Uh, while that has been happening in the background, three of the four Illinois cases filed a petition for cert, short for certiorari, with the United States Supreme Court saying, you need to take this case up now before we get a final judgment on the merits because the Seventh Circuit's appellate court ruling is just so bad. You also have, so you have the FFL case, the Barnett NSSF case, and the, um, the SAF FPC ISRA case, those three cases from Southern Illinois, filed cert petitions. Now, the Gun Owners of America, who are part of the FFL case, filed their own cert petition. Um, they wanted to make some different arguments. The FFL guys, they, filed, they joined the cert petition put on by NSSF in the Barnett people. And uh, Clement Murphy, Aaron Murphy, the lead lawyer, they've had the lead that was designated the lead case by Judge McGlynn. Uh, over a year ago. So you've got that. And then you had the Naperville case, uh, which deals with uh, Beavis. Uh, you've got the Herrera case, who is an individual who works with the Chicago uh, SWAT team uh, a who challenged <laughs> a the doctor state who band. works with the, the SWAT team, which is yeah. uh, interesting. Yeah, he's, uh, he's a doctor of sorts, I guess. And he provide you know it, it's part of this whole new tactical medic program that SWAT teams have been engaged in uh, I have some friends that did that they were paramedics in various fire departments and there were some mutual aid SWAT teams and they were incorporating medics right with the team uh, and so Herrera I think in a mistake challenged Cook County's ban Chicago's ban and the Illinois ban all in one. The problem is that then allowed Cook County and Chicago to come in as defendants and file briefs. So instead of just having the state in a brief, they got three times the pages because they're all defendants. Um, well, and I think, though, Todd, I mean, you've got uh, you know, the Naperville case was filed in November of 2022. You know, several months before uh, the the state passed the statewide gun and magazine ban. I, I, I don't know when Herrera's case was filed, but I think it also was before the state's ban was enacted. Uh, so you have all of these uh, litigants uh, that are ultimately saying, hey, you know, we got to modify our case so that we can also include the state ban. Uh, but all these cases uh, being moved to conference, uh, your prediction, what is that going to look like? Are they going to consolidate these and just get to the substance of whether or not the lower courts and states are adhering to what the U.S. Supreme Court said in NYSERPA versus Bruin? I think I think that's a possibility because they also included Bianchi, which is a Maryland case. And the thing about Bianchi is Bianchi was at the U.S. Supreme Court once before. It was pending when New York was handed down. And it was one of the four cases, along with Duncan, the California magazine ban, that were GVR. Granted, they granted cert accepting the case, but instead of going through a full ruling, they, vac they vacated the lower court ruling against our side and then remanded for further proceedings in accordance with the outcome of New York. And you can see that in Bianchi, it took them forever 
to get back to a three judge panel for oral arguments. And with that, uh, they had their orals. The orals seemed to go very good for our side. And then you had, they were sitting on it for 13 months, mm. which is a very, very long time. Look how fast Easterbrook cranked out the opinion in our case. Um, well, that was about I'm four months mistaken. difference, I believe. Yeah, we, we had orals on the 29th of June, and we got a decision the 3rd of November. I mean, you know, 120 days is about par for the course, uh, but, you know, 13 months. And they still hadn't issued a decision. And then the full court sat down and grabbed this from the lower court, the, the three-judge panel, without getting an opinion. It wasn't that there was an opinion for our side rendered and then there was an appeal to go on bonk. Oh, no. They just said, ah, we're going to short circuit this. And so since Bianchi was already there and previously had a judgment on the merits, and now they've played this game, and this kind of goes in hand with what's happened with the Duncan case out in California in the Ninth Circus. Uh, and, yes, I say the Ninth Circus. And, and so with that, you've got – Bianchi out of Maryland, you've got five cases out of Illinois. And I think that it's likely that if they if they take Bianchi, I think I think that's in a better posture to take it, but they're just getting hammered with so much stuff. I mean, everybody used to say when these baloney opinions would come out that they gotta be seeing this. Well, there's no getting around it. Obviously, they were paying attention to some of it because they gave a hand slap to the Second Circuit and what they were doing to all the New York carry stuff that was passed post their decision. And so right now, what are they going to do? You know, you have Rahimi, the federal uh, challenge to a federal de domestic violence law sitting up there that they heard arguments in and were waiting a decision. You have Cargill, a, uh, the challenge to the bump stock rule issued by ATF, argued over a month ago and now pending there. I was working with Second Amendment Law Center, Second Amendment Defense Coalition, uh, the FFL guys, and we filed an amici brief to Cargill telling them the Seventh Circuit decision is so bad that if you don't narrow a ruling on uh, what ATF can do, we are one regulator and regulation away from them ruling that ARs are readily convertible and therefore they can be banned as machine guns, um, which is what they've said about bump stocks. And we wanted to get that in front of the court. And we've been telling them how bad this is. So do we get something that says AR-15s are in common use and then they GVR this stuff saying try again? Uh, do they accept it? Do they hold it and just relist these things, which there have been several cases on our side that were relisted and relisted. They did that prior to New York, and then they kicked stuff back and said, see New York, try again, Bianchi being one of those cases. So if the courts just haven't got it, and a big part of our briefs from all of our side that have gone in are saying, you took 13 years from McDonald to Bruin to take another 2A case, you cannot let the lower courts run amok for another decade. Well, especially can't. when you have, for example, like what happened in Illinois, uh, a very large sweeping ban of more than 170 named firearms, semi-automatic pistols, shotguns, rifles, AR-15 included, the magazine capacity issue, uh, the registration issue, uh, and then everything else from there. Uh, so clearly there's uh, there's important issues that the U.S. Supreme Court has to tackle. Todd, uh, just a few more moments here. Uh, what's the status of your uh, ammunition tax lawsuit? So last week, the uh, we... We're, we lost in the circuit court based, you know, based on our 2A claim. We appealed. The appellate court said, nope, you got to reinstate it. And last week, the county, Cook County, uh, filed an appeal to the state Supreme Court. So it is now up for them to consider whether or not they are going to grant Cook County's appeal 
so they can grant it. And we're going to be arguing in front of the state Supreme Court prematurely before a final decision on the merits, or they could just let it stand. Uh, we'll see. So we're going to be in front of the, we'll see what they say. If they take it, great. I'll be down there to watch the arguments. Well, and this is, uh, this know. is the second time they've, <laughs> the Supreme Court's taken this case, right? Well, they took the original GSL case, then it went back up there, and it, you know, it's been, it, it's been kicked around a couple of times. So yeah, th this is, we'll see what they're gonna do. But uh, Cook County is doing everything, and they're doing everything they can to slow th things down. And if you read their brief, they keep going down the same road that they've tried in the semi-auto bans that it's only for guns for self-defense. They keep trying to read something into these decisions. That's not there, that in order for a gun to be protected under the Second Amendment, it actually has to be used in common use for self-defense. You have to pull it, point it, pull the trigger. Um, that's their take on, you know, they're, they're trying to drive a bus through some dicta that that is the only thing that counts. Unlike the Catano decision from the Supreme Court, where they said, oh no, stun guns, it's a modern accoutrement. I mean, even though Ben Franklin was flying a kite, trying to find electricity and everything, I don't think they were contemplating stun guns at the time. And stun guns were found, one, to be modern weapons protected by the Second Amendment, two, in common use, and they stated a number back in that day of about 200,000. And that scares the living bejesus out of the other side, that if there are 200,000 of anything out there, that they're considered in common use. Uh, so they keep making these specious arguments, and we'll, th that Cook County is trying it in their brief once again, as well as the state. And the state is also arguing that there's no circuit split. And you're not going to get a circuit split likely because if you look at how the circuits are aligned, it's like, you know, Indiana in the Seventh Circuit is not going to pass a, a bad ban. Texas, they're not going to pass a blue with the Fifth Circuit. Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, none of those states are going to pass a gun ban. So it's like all the bad states are lumped into bad circuits. All the good states are lumped into good circuits. And it's unlikely that you're going to get a split like this. So unless there was a federal ban passed somehow um, and you could go down to the Fifth Circuit and challenge that. So that's why we've been real hard against this. But, you know, circuit split argument. And that's why the other side is pushing it so hard that there is no circuit split. But um, it's been that way on a couple of other issues. So we'll see. I mean, there are. You need a. I'm starting to literally have to put a whiteboard yes. up as a bingo card yes. to try to keep tabs. Trust me, I, mean, I, I you think know, the fact you know, that, maybe maybe sometime this week, and I can build something. I don't know with your help, because uh, it would be helpful to to all those who are tracking this as well, watching channels like this and watching channels like Freedom Steel. Todd Vandermeij, greatly appreciate you taking the time with us. We'll connect again soon. All right. Hey, no problem, guys. Frag out. All right. Later on, Todd Vandermeid. Okay, guys, uh, stay tuned. Much more with Bishop on air, as always. Uh, just like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell, all right?